Jesus has just finished the Passover supper. He has taken the bread and broken it and likened it to his body that would be broken for them. He took the cup after the supper and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood which will be shed for the remission of sins. And then he made to them a very startling statement. He said, one of you is going to betray me. And they all began to question, saying, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Until Judas said, Lord, is it I? And Jesus said, Thou hast said. Now, while this, from this, an immediate transition, they're, 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 they've been challenged really their their hearts have been challenged as jesus said one of you are going to betray me they've examined their hearts lord is it i and it must have been a pretty humbling kind of thing to think that could i possibly be the one that's going to betray him now they go directly from that into a dispute among themselves and there was also, it says, a strife among them. And the word also is the connecting word. Also, while they were saying, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? They were having this little strife, dispute among themselves. Of all things, over which one was going to be the greatest when Jesus established his kingdom? arguing among themselves. This was an ongoing argument among the disciples. Way back in the ninth chapter of Luke, going back to the Mount of Transfiguration, just after Jesus was transfigured before his disciples up there in the area of Caesarea Philippi. The disciples up there were arguing among themselves as who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. It's back there in the ninth chapter of Luke where it's recorded. And here they were disputing over this issue then. And at that time, Jesus tried to teach them that you should become like a little child. That unless you're like a little child, you weren't going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And he tried to quiet their dispute. It is interesting to me that the earlier dispute in the ninth chapter of Luke broke out right after Jesus told his disciples that he was going to be put to death. He was going to be turned over to the hands of sinful men and be put to death. And, and they began to argue then over who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Now as he takes the elements of his death, the broken bread, the cup, again the argument breaks out. Who's going to be the greatest? Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel tells us that at one time the mother of James and John came to Jesus and she worshipped him. And she said, Lord, would you grant my request? And Jesus said, what is it? Said, well, when you come into your kingdom, can one of my sons sit on your right hand and the other sit on your left? Would you get, oh, Jewish mother, you can't blame her. My boys, you know. Let one sit on the right, one sit on the left. And Jesus said, are they able to drink of the cup that I shall drink? And they, she said, oh, yes, Lord. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, Lord, we can. And Jesus said, well, you will surely drink of the cup 
But to grant that privilege of sitting on my right hand and left is really not mine. It will be something that will be granted by the Father. And it says, and the other disciples were indignant at James and John. They no doubt figured that they set their mother up to it. And this dispute was going on. It was a long-standing dispute among the disciples. This desire for greatness, position, authority. What an inappropriate time, though, for such an argument. Here Jesus is right on the eve of his crucifixion. Here the heart of Jesus is so heavy, it's breaking. In a moment, he will be in the garden agonizing. As he prays, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. As he is sweating great drops of blood to the ground and hear all of this pressure, this heaviness on Jesus, and what are his disciples doing? Disputing among, striving among themselves as to which one of them was going to be the greatest when he entered the kingdom. This should cause us to realize that when the Lord chooses people to serve him, he chooses just plain, ordinary people much like us. People who lack so completely in refinement and in discernment. Here are the disciples. These men upon whom will be placed the responsibility of carrying the gospel into all the world. And at this critical moment, instead of really picking up on Jesus and sensing the heaviness that John writes about, and he was very sorrowful, and he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. And they, they didn't pick up on it, but they were so interested in self that they had this big rhubarb going among themselves as who was going to be the greatest. And you know that each of them were voting for themselves. None of them was voting for the other fellow. They were men who were looking out for themselves. They were men who were basically selfish. But it should be also noted that though Jesus chooses men like that, he doesn't leave them like that. The Lord has to start with what he has. <laughs> but then he begins to work to change us from what we are into what he wants us to be. And that is a process that is dramatic, but it's also progressive. There is that immediate dramatic change when a person is truly born again. And it should be noted that up to this time, Peter wasn't really converted yet. For in, a, in the next lesson, in fact, or perhaps the one after that, according to how far we get next week, but Jesus said to Peter, when you are converted, strengthen your brothers. Not yet converted. Been disciples following Jesus, have known the power of God in their lives, and yet Jesus said, when you are converted, then strengthen your brothers. There is to be a change. There is to be a dramatic change. But it's also progressive. So, though when the Spirit of God comes into my life, there are marked changes immediately, 
as the Spirit of God indwells my life over the process of time, there are continuing changes that are being made. So we, with open faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed from glory to glory into the same image by the power of His Spirit that's working in us. So, thank God I'm not what I was, but I am still not yet what I'm going to be. The Lord is still working in my life as the Spirit of God conforms me into the image of Jesus Christ. And so the disciples, plain, ordinary men, flawed, filled with faults, carnal as can be, because Paul tells us that one of the marks of carnality is strife and division. And he said, as long as there are these strifes and divisions among you, are ye not carnal? And he, and he said these were marks of carnality. And so here are the disciples upon whom will soon rest the responsibility of taking the gospel of the world. Here they are as carnal as can be as they're interested concerning themselves and the place that they will have of prominence when Jesus establishes his kingdom. When the Lord calls us to serve him, we often disqualify ourselves because we know that we are so flawed. Like Moses, we can find a lot of excuses why God should call someone else. Like Jeremiah, we can uh, beg off of the call of God because of our own disqualifications. But there is a great fallacy there because we look at ourselves in our present state and we realize in my present state, I couldn't do anything for the Lord, but the Lord doesn't plan to leave you in your present state. And someone has said very aptly that God's callings are God's enablings. In other words, God will not call you to something that he will not enable you to do. God will never command you to do something that he will not give you the power to do. And many times the Lord commanded people to do impossible things. But they discovered that the moment they willed to do the impossible thing, all that they needed to do it was given to them instantly by the Lord. When the Lord said to the man who had that withered hand, stretch forth your hand. Impossible, Lord. This hand is withered. It's been withered for years. I haven't been able to move this hand for years, Lord. And he could have argued with Jesus. But at the command of Jesus, he stretched forth his hand. And the moment he willed to obey, all that he needed was given to him. And so with you, as God calls you, the moment you respond, you will find that all that you need as far as power and all will be given to you. And that is why it is so wrong to disqualify yourselves because of what you are, your background. Uh, a lot of you have already read the new book, Harvest. And what an uh, illustration it is of how God takes very unlikely instruments. Sort of like the 12 apostles. These guys that God is using in such a powerful way. They came out of a life of carnality and strife and messed up lives, but the Lord transformed them and is using them in a marvelous way. And the Lord can transform you and use you in a marvelous way. Our problem is that we just disqualify ourselves. Moses said, Lord, I can't speak. You know that. I stutter and just not able, Lord. 
Jeremiah said, I'm just a kid. Who's going to listen to a kid? You need to call an older man. And we all have reasons why God couldn't use us. There's a flaw. There's a problem. Perhaps there's carnality. But if I will respond to the call of God, God will empower me by his spirit. He will change me and he will enable me to do that which he has called me to do. And so there was this strife among the disciples, which should be accounted the greatest. And Jesus began then to teach them concerning the path to greatness. You, you're interested in being great, fellas? This is the path to greatness. First of all, the heathen, they love being great. They love to exercise lordship. They love to rule over people. They love to get people under their thumb. That's a mark of the heathen, the pagans. Many a carnal man is driven by the lust to rule over other men, to control others. There are always those people who are grasping for a position of prominence, authority, power, rulership. People that are driven by the ambition to be the president of the company. And they don't care who they crawl over to get there. And then when they get there, they often become tyrants. And even though they are tyrants, they want to be known as benefactors. They want those that they are tyrannizing to look up to them and say, oh my you know, how we have benefited under your leadership. And he said, thus the pagans love this lordship bit and they want to be known as benefactors. The Ptolemies who ruled over the Syro Grecian Empire. You know that when Alexander died, the Grecian Empire was divided into four aspects Greece, Asia Minor, Syria, and Egypt. Four of the generals took the areas. And there was bitter fighting between the Ptolemies of Syria and the Seleucids of. Egypt. One of these Ptolemies took the title of Erogites, and he was called Ptolemy Erogites. Erogites in Greek is the word benefactor. And so he said, I'm Ptolemy the benefactor. And he wanted people to, to look up to him as, as a benefactor over the people. And so Jesus is really sort of speaking in a satirical way here as he talks about the heathen who love this lordship and yet they want to be called benefactors. But yet they're, they're, they're just lording over people. They're, they're tyrannizing people. These people still exist today. You'll find them in bureaucracy, in planning commissions, <laughs> cities and counties and states. They want you to jump through their hoops. They want you to bow to their whims. And yet they want to be known as benefactors to our community. Yeah. 
Jesus said, But ye shall not be so. Now, you'll notice some of the words are italicized, which means they were added. Literally, Jesus said, But ye not so. And I like it. It's a little stronger. If you take the, the, to make the sentence sort of flow, the translators added a couple of words. But Jesus said, but you, not so. You're not to seek to exercise lordship over other people. But you, not so. Now, in spite of this command of Jesus to his disciples... It is unfortunate, but the church is fraught with men who want to exercise lordship. Though Jesus said, but you not so. It's a trait of the heathens. Shouldn't be yours. And yet, we had, oh, a few years ago, this movement throughout the church, what, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, called the shepherding movement that just ripped up so many churches and destroyed so many people. Men who set themselves up as shepherds over the flock, but to the extent that they demanded that those who were under their shepherding care submit to them in every decision. You could not buy a car. You could not marry a girl. You could not do anything without, first of all, submitting it to these elders or these men who were shepherding over you. Their philosophy was that being a little gringo you didn't know enough to make your own decisions and you didn't know enough to hear from god and therefore they would be responsible for your decisions and in this shepherding movement there was that teaching that if a man is your shepherd and he tells you to do something that is not god's will for your life you should submit to it and you're submitting to him you're all right even if it's wrong what you're doing I mean, that's really exercising lordship. That you have to blindly follow the edicts of the shepherd. You can't think for yourselves. Of course, the Mormons sort of say that about their apostles. The statements of the apostles cannot be challenged. And you are in error if you challenge the edicts are the statements of the apostles of the Mormon church. They are to be obeyed without question, unquestioned obedience. And the Jehovah Witnesses do much the same. For they are not allowed to really question the edicts that come forth from the leadership in New York, from the council. As these men choose to interpret the Scripture, so must you believe the Scripture to be. You cannot really argue with it. You cannot challenge their interpretation. You see, those who love to exercise lordship want a bunch of non-thinking people under them. If you think for yourself, you're a threat. And that comes from a position of weakness. If I'm not sure in, in my positions, then I demand unquestioned obedience. But if you are sure in your position, you don't have to demand it or command it. It's, people are going to see that it's right and they'll follow. Of course, within the Catholic Church, you have the Pope who is a spokesman for God. And when he speaks for God, he speaks infallibly. And, and you are to believe what he said. Or the dogmas of the church must be believed along with the scriptures. And even though some of the dogmas of the church, such as the perpetual virginity of Mary, could be challenged by some of the scriptures in Matthew and Mark that speak of the brothers of Jesus and even names the brothers, 
still because it is the dogma that has been established by the church fathers, it must be believed. There are those ministers, and, and notice I haven't singled out one single group. I've hit them all. <laughs> the Pentecostals with their shepherding. I mean, it's, it's, it's throughout the church. Those in leadership seeking to exercise lordship over the flock of God, though Jesus said, not so. Among you, not so. You're not to do it. And yet, there are so many men, because they are called ministers, feel that that title should bring them special attention. I should be taken to the front of the line. You should carry my bags. You should pick up the tab. Because after all, I'm a minister. Oh, what a contradiction of terms. You see, the word minister and the word servant are synonymous. They mean the same thing. And to say, well, you ought to open the door for me because I'm the servant. <laughs> you ought to give special attention to me and wait on me because I'm the servant. Is a total contradiction of of thought, of idea. I wish that we could just get rid of this title of minister because it's come to mean something that it isn't. Because it doesn't mean a position of special attention, special favor or whatever. It means servant. And yet the, the, the term minister, you see, has come to, or if you take the title of reverend, <laughs> and then they go, the right reverend. And then the holy right reverend. And then the most holy right reverend. Oh, God, deliver us from titles. Paul, the most right reverend to the church of Galatia. No. Paul, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Peter, the bond slave of Jesus Christ. Jude, servant or bond servant of Jesus Christ. You see, they got the message. They realize the path of greatness isn't achieved by blindly stepping over others, tromping down others, exercising lordship. But it comes through being a servant. Jesus in Mark's gospel said, Whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister or servant. And whosoever will be the chief shall be the servant of all. Here Jesus said, But you, not so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. Now, in that culture, 
there was such a built-in respect for the elders that the younger people always took a place of subservient, a subservient place to the elders. It was just a part of their whole cultural ingrained existence. If you were a young person, you respected the elders and you took a place of, uh, of subservience to them. And so Jesus said, you want to be the greatest, be as the younger, be as one who is younger, be in a place of subservience to others. You remember how Jesus threw a enigma at the Pharisees when he said, um, the Messiah, is he this, going to be the son of David? They said, oh, yes. He said, well, then, if he is the son of David, how come David called him Lord if he's his son? And it was, it, it, he stumped them. They didn't, they didn't have any answer. You see, no son, no father would call his son Lord. That is just so antithetical to their whole cultural background. No father would say to his son, Lord, what shall I do? You know, I mean, that, that's just, you know, they were horror struck by the very idea. And when Jesus pointed out that David called the Messiah Lord, he said, then how can he be his son when he calls him Lord? Oh, no thought of that. Don't know. Wild, you know, the concept was wild. And so Jesus said, look, if you want to be the greatest, then be as the younger. Take the lower. Take the place of, of a servant in service to others. And then he went on to say, and he that is chief, let him be as he that serves. Now, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God and thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him what? The form of a servant. Here he was. He was in the form of God. He didn't think it something to be grasped, to be equal with God. And yet he humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This is called the kenosis. The word kenosis in Greek is emptying. And this is the emptying of Jesus, starting with God, form of God, Thought it not something to be grasped, to be equal with God. I and the Father are one. And yet he humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a servant, servant and came in the likeness of men. Humbled himself more and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's as low as you can get. This is the bottom completely emptied out now. Even below that of a servant now, he's humbled himself to the point of obedience unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, Jesus is right at that point of the total emptying from God, not robbery to be equal with God. He's now gone all the way to the bottom, below normal man. 
to obedience to death on the cross. He's come. Here we are, right on the eve of the crucifixion, where the final emptying and that final step on down to the obedience to the cross, death on the cross, that's the, that's the final and last step, and he's just ready to take that. And here are the 12 he's chosen to be his disciples. 11 now, Judas is already gone. And what are they doing? They're arguing about who's going to be the greatest, who's going to get above the others, who will stand and be able to tell the others where to go and what to do. How opposite the Lord. And when we seek to exercise lordship and authority and all over others, how opposite we are to our Lord who emptied himself and went all the way to the bottom. Because Jesus said, I did not come to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give my life as a ransom for all. I didn't come for you to wait on me. I didn't come for you to serve me. I came to serve you. Just earlier, John tells us that when they had gathered for this final supper, it was Jesus that pulled up his robe and tied it with the sash. He girded himself. And that means pulling up your robe, tying it with the sash so you can move more freely. And the servants always would do that so that they could serve. And he took a towel and he went around and began to wash their feet. The place of a servant. That was the servant's job. And here was Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. And when he came to Peter, you remember how Peter said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. He thought, boy, these other guys have blown it. I know what Jesus is doing. You know, he's wanting one of us to take the towel, and, 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 and these guys are all blowing it, man. They don't know what's going on, you know. And when he got around to Peter, Peter says, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet, you know. You know mark another one up for me. And Jesus said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have anything to do with me. And then, Lord, give me a bath. <laughs> Jesus said, no, you're still missing the point. And he said to his disciples, do you see what I have done unto you? So ought ye to wash one another's feet. Now he's not talking literally we ought to go around washing everybody's feet. What he is saying is that we need to take the position of a servant to each other. Rather than lordship over each other, we should be as those who serve one another. Jesus said, I've set an example for you that you might serve one another, really. This is the example. Now, here they had just seen the example of Jesus. In fact, at the meal, they sat at the table and Jesus went around and gave them the bread. Jesus went around and filled their cups. He served them the meal. He had washed their feet. He had served the meal to them while they sat at the table. And what are they arguing about? Who's going to be the greatest? And they're missing the point completely. Oh, God help us. God help us. May we not miss the point when it's being enacted right before us, when the Lord is demonstrating right before us, how blind can we be? And so Jesus again points out, who's greater? Verse 27. He that sits at the meal or he that serves? Is it not he who sits? 
but I am among you as he who serves. So he had to make the point. They didn't get it, so he had to make the point. Who's the greater? The one who sits and eats or the one who serves? He said, surely the one who sits has the greater position. The other one is serving him. But I am among you as he who serves. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, then learn to be the servant of all, the path to greatness. And Jesus demonstrated it. He taught it. And in the midst of his teaching, by illustration, they missed the message and were disputing among themselves as to their position of greatness and power and authority. Who's going to be the greatest? The path of greatness. is the path of service. Learn to serve. Learn to serve one another. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. He will lift you up. Let's pray. Father, May we be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving ourselves. As the Holy Spirit has held up before us the mirror to let us get a glimpse of ourselves tonight. And he showed us the true path to greatness it is not by disputing and striving but by yielding, submitting, serving. And so, Lord, even as you came to serve, as we go forth as your representatives, may we remember, Lord, that the servant is not greater than his Lord, but as your representative, may we go forth also to serve. To serve one another in love. To sacrifice and give of ourselves for one another that we might be your disciples. In Jesus' name, amen.